Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on how to become a safety culture change agent. My name is Anthony Gibbs, I'm from Sendus and I'll be your host for today and I'm very pleased to have uh, three very special guests uh, to talk to us in this really uh, important topic area. So we've got Dave Carter from Austral Fisheries, Rod Mule from Australia Post and Deidre Lewis from Origin Energy. So we'll be giving a little bit more context about uh, who these people are for those of you who don't know in just a moment, but uh, thank you so much uh, for coming along. Um, we've had over, we've had close to 350 people register for this webinar. So uh, obviously it's a combination of your expertise uh, along with a very important topic, which has drawn so many people uh, to come and have a listen. So we'll, we'll dig into getting things moving. For those of you who aren't across who Centres is, we are an organisation focused on creating safety culture change to get more people home safe. So our broad mission is to change the lives of individuals and organisations for the better every, every day. And as I said, we do that through the applica application of psychology and neuroscience to uh, understand organisational culture and create better leadership and team outcomes. The tool we're using for today's webinar is called GoToWebinar and there's a control panel uh, displayed up on the screen. So I'll just spend a little, uh, couple of moments uh, with some housekeeping with you all. So you can expand and collapse that screen at any time using the orange arrow that you can see. Uh, everyone will be muted uh, throughout this call. However, you can put comments and chats uh, into the comments section. Make sure you press send if you want that to come through. I'll do my best uh, to get to any questions that do come through, although we've already had uh, quite a few uh, roll in, so we'll see how we're going for time. There's also a webinar attached uh, to this particular webinar. Uh, sorry, there's also a handout attached to the webinar, which goes through some high level strategies to consider when looking at driving cultural change within your organization. So feel free to download that resource. So without further ado, I'll introduce our special guests for today. So I'll start with Dave, uh, Dave Carter, uh, is CEO of Austral Fisheries and he's gone from deckhand to CEO. Uh, David has worked his entire life at Austral Fisheries and, and its pre predecessors. David has a strong commitment to sustainable science-based fisheries management, uh, preserving the natural environment. 2016, David led Austral Fisheries to become the first seafood business in the world to achieve carbon neutral certification. He was introduced into the National Seafood Industry Hall of Fame in 2012 and in 2020, he received the the, steward, the Marine Stewardship Council's Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, David has a fascinating uh, safety journey story uh, for Austral Fisheries, uh, where he's been able to really transform quite a, a unique and challenging industry, dealing with a whole range of different unpredictable energies uh, into something that's, that's performing really well. So Dave, really fascinated and, and keen to hear your perspective and your stories. Uh, and you've got a few of them, I know. Um, next one is, De so thank you, David. Uh, Deidre Lewis, Deidre, um, uh, well known on the speaking circuit these days. So Deidre is passionate about leading change and has been doing it for over 25 years. She's got lots of experience in the high risk industries as a HSEQ professional. And she currently works at Origin Energy as the general manager of HSE for the downstream business. When asked what gets her excited, she says it's always about the people. She loves to learn and share her knowledge and recently been dipping her toes into many other podcasts as, as some of you may have already seen. Both inside and outside of work, Deidre is committed to mentoring people who are disadvantaged or simply want to build better careers. So fantastic, Deidre, thank you for coming along. And last but not least is Rod Mule. So he's a general manager of safety and wellbeing at Australia Post. Rod is a general manager of safety and wellbeing at Australia Post and has worked as a head of health and safety in several organizations. He's covered a wide range of industries from public transport, food manufacturing, health, waste, oil and gas. Rod helps organisations transform organisational cultures and capability, and, and capability that delivers tangible and sustainable results. Rod started his career in general business roles before em embracing the opportunity to impact people's lives through a safety career. So again, thank you all for coming along and uh, really excited about this, this conversation. So how are we going to tackle today in such a, such a big topic? We're going to do it in uh, four high level steps. Uh, we've, so, so we've uh, basically collated the questions that have come through and the categories that have come through have broadly landed in the following areas. What does it take to be a safety culture change agent? 
how to shift conversation about safety and influence challenging stakeholders. How do you overcome key challenges and show tangible results? And what are the critical elements to consider in driving safety culture change through the workforce? So I know from having firsthand experience with uh, conversations with a number of leaders and obviously with the questions that come through from all of our webinars, these are, are really burning topics for so many of our listeners who, who want to drive change within their organisations but get stuck from time to time. So I wanted to kick off um, the process, Rod, by checking in with some of your experience. So in your experience, what does it take to lead and drive safety culture change in an organisation? So um, you know, as an individual, how do you go about starting that process? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Um, look, it's there's certain things I think you need um, as a safety professional to try and help drive the cultural change program in any organisation. So first of all, I think you need to have in, in your mind that <clears throat> cultural change is, is more than just processes and procedures and systems. So what I find talking to people, sometimes safety professionals, you know, if I ask how you're changing culture, they'll say, oh, well, I changed the process or I changed the system or I, you know, did something. And that they are elements of a, of a culture change, but you need to influence the hearts and minds of people at all levels. And I would say um, people who do that well is you have, I set out to make sure, for example, in my organisations, that I have a very clear strategy that says we're going to focus on critical risks of this business, which in, you know, each business is a bit different, um, but there are often similarities across um, organisations. Um, focus on the well-being of people and heavy element nowadays in psychological well-being. Have a focus on um, managing injuries when you have them and getting people returned to work. And um, I think that's a critical element in um, supporting people. And then the other bit that oversits the top of that is building and investing in cultural and leadership change, um, both at the front line and at the and at senior leaders. And to do that, if you have that strategy, you go, well, how do you do it? Well, it depends where you are on the maturity scale, but I, I use data and stories and try and combine those two things to tell a story about why we need to change. And I'll give an example at Australia Post, um, for example, where we have, um, when I started, five and a half thousand posties on motorbikes, um, rocking around delivering letters and parcels, small parcels. They are extremely vulnerable to human error. So uh, they're out, the posties are out on the workforce, they're out on the road, they're unsupervised. So you're relying on two things. You're relying on them being switched on the whole time, which is you can influence, but you can't guarantee. People are human. They make errors um, and they have lapses. They get tired. They get distracted. Um, and you're also um, uh, it relying on other road users to, to be switched on the whole time. Again, they're the same, right? So the, the downside is we're on a motorbike and we had a, a recent fatality where a, a four-wheel drive uh, hit and killed one of our posties late last year. And the four-wheel drive... Um, uh, gentleman just didn't said I just didn't see him. Just didn't see him. It was a clear, bright blue sky. No reason why he didn't see him, but he just wasn't concentrating. And that's human, unfortunately. And the problem is where it's fatal. And we have the other side of things where we have posties who who lose it. So, so for culture, I try and say, well, what's the story I can tell about that to help drive cultural change? And in, in a leadership team, I want to influence purchasing new equipment, going to safer modes of transport. So how do I tell a story using though the data around accidents and maybe the story around an individual to help people understand it's not about just training people because that only gets us so far. We need to do both, train people, educate them, engage them, but also um, try and have safer modes of delivery, safer, safer things in motorbikes. So we combine those and get change. And I think that's a key skill. So how do you take the data and the insights Combine that into a story so you touch the hearts and minds, but with some hard evidence-based data that supports it. And um, and I think that's really powerful. If you just do one or the other and you go with the moral imperative for the staff or with the leadership team, it gets some people but not others. If you just go with the data, you get some people and not others. You've got to try and combine that and weave that into a story. And that's a key skill, I think, to help drive cultural change at all levels in an organisation. Because once you get that, then you get people taking action and, and supporting change. Yeah, great. I, I could see you nodding along there, there Deirdre. Was there, um, you know, if you're starting a safety culture conversation in, in an organisation, and, and I know that you 
shake things up and you, you like to have new and challenging views on the way to do things. How do you go about starting that conversation and introducing that concept? Yeah, I think very similarly to Rod, I think storytelling um, is just super important when you're trying to um, bring people along on a voyage with you because that's really what it is, I think. So um, uh, I think when you are in a place where you're, it, 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 I think culture is, it's it's a continuum and, I, and when we talk about safety culture, it's, it's a component of an organisation. It's not one thing. It, it, you have a, you know, we don't talk about quality culture or reliability culture or um, all of those things. We talk about the culture of an organisation and I think when you're trying to introduce something that's new or different, um, being able to explain the why I think is really important and that's where that storytelling piece comes in. And like Rod was talking about, I think when you've got a huge amount of stakeholders, you've got to be able to really understand your stakeholder groups so that you can um, uh, tell a story that um, connects to each person in the organisation in whichever context they sit in. Um, I think it's also really important that you understand your organisation because if you're trying to make a change and you don't really understand where you are um, as an organisation, um, it's really difficult and a lot of changes we know fails. So I think part of what we need to do is to really understand the context in which we're sitting um, and the business context. Sometimes when you're in a safety role, for example, can be missed because um, some some safety people haven't got the business context that sits behind a lot of decision making and the um, and where business might be wanting to go. So I think safety people need to be embedded in the business to understand the business, um, and that's part of how you influence culture and influence decision making. I think so. Yeah, great. Just so, starting uh, a con just, sorry, Anthony, you go. No, you go ahead, Deidre. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. So I think starting a conversation, you can start it anywhere, I think, it, and it's about just having a conversation, a simple conversation with whoever you're talking to about what you want to shift is is really important from the, the people who are doing the work to the people who are making decisions. So, yeah. so really interesting, understanding the context and then understanding the stakeholders within within the within what you're trying to achieve and it comes back to something we often say at center seeking to understand before being understood so if you can understand what's going on for the people within the organization what that context is and and overlap that business savviness to it you can start a better quality conversation by the sounds of it and, and david this is where i'm really interested in in your lens because you're you're coming at it from a ceo who's who's really probably embraced and driven a safety transformation uh within within your business what tips do you have for dealing with different stakeholders that are speaking with speaking with different languages and, and perhaps on different stages of the journey themselves? Yeah, yeah, we had um we had a bit of uh, we had a bit of incentive motivation uh, a push for us um, which wasn't in your introduction but we had a mortality uh, a fatality in uh, late 2013. Um, at that stage, I didn't feel that we were um, a particularly um, bad safety organization but um, Swiss, Swiss cheese has taught us that shit happens and um, uh, history also taught us that um, tragically the big gains in safety are written in the blood of dead workers so um, we're perhaps a living example of that um, the uh, I think the relatively small business so our environment <coughs> is uh, a varying number of people on prawn boats. It could be say six, six, uh, six souls on the boat in close quarters for extended periods, working, living, playing, uh, trying to be productive <coughs> um, under all sorts of uh, weather conditions and the um, uh, playing with uh, various winches and loads and ropes. And, um, and just to make it a little, little bit more interesting, everything's moving. So, um, we're really uh, generally super aware of the uh, of the risks that we had, but um, really post that event, um, you know that the the system was 
what is right for culture change, cult, um, you know, change, whether it's safety culture or change of any sort, um, in our experience is driven by you know, a couple of simple things. And one is the um, the desire to change. So we had that in spades. Um, it was just surrounding, surrounding us for um, a long period. And we may get to talk about this later, but the business imper <coughs> imperative for providing um, a safe working place uh, can simply mean access to talent or not, and that's a big deal. Uh, the clarity of the vision, so um, uh, just how clear you are on um, what um, what it all looks like. Where do you where do you want to go, and then the um, and then what sort of a plan you have to execute that. So once you've got all those things, a desire, a strong desire, strong vision, strong plan, you've got the um, you've got the groundwork for uh, a pretty effective change. Uh, be it in safety or any other cultural change that you want to make and so um, uh, we were able to do that but I think um, the other the other piece which is is critical is that from senior leadership right through um, there is that consistent um, commitment to that so uh, the workforce will pick in a flash an inconsistency where um, you know the C-suites announced some big fancy new plan and it's blah 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 it's everything's beautiful and then then uh, the boss walks past somebody's not wearing sh sort of steel cap boots on the do on the dock and not say anything game over and that um, as you psychologists would say that that would be a screaming cognitive dissonance right there and that would bring you um, horribly undone Anthony yeah so I guess that that some of this links back to I think comments that Rod and Deidre both made it's about I guess understanding um, what, what the drivers for different people are, but also it sounds like leveraging the data that you've got, or in this case, the incident you've got to be able to, to create, create that, to create that change. So, Rod, if I go back to a, a comment that you made that I think links to this. So we chatted offline about, about the incidents that you typically have within your organization and a lot of them being around motorbikes per se. <laughs> so like creating the value proposition for that sort of change, how, how do you, how do you sort of attack a, a process like that in the context of what David's spoken about? Yeah, so well, probably just even dealing with the the question on there about reluctant stakeholders, I'll give you the context. So if you're a a postie on a motorbike, guess what you ride? You ride motorbikes. <laughs> so so we have posties who own Harleys and Triumphs and Kawasaki's and Hondas and all sorts of things, right? And they love them, right? I've met posties who own three motorbikes, right? The reason they became a postie amongst other things is it fits their lifestyle and they like the idea of being their own boss and riding their motorbike. Now, um, we go and say, what we're going to do is put you on a safer motor transport that looks like a souped up golf cart, um, which we call electronic distribution vehicle. You should have seen them falling over themselves to jump on board that sexy beast. So, uh, so that was a hard sell right here's a change you join to ride a motorbike you love riding motorbikes here's what we think is a safer mode so these are a lot of reluctant people including the union and the union were getting lobbied by their members saying oh my god they're trying to force us onto this three-wheel motorbikes they're illegal they're unsafe they're this they're that throw up any reason why you wouldn't want to get on one um and and it, and it gets back to i think that natural human thing is is why are you pick it on me i'm not a problem I, I'm a safe rider. I've been riding motorbikes since I was 13. What's my problem? Why are you trying to change me? It's all, you know, sort of intellectually people struggle with um, in every business. Like until they have their own fatality or a very close issue, it's nothing about me. It's really hard to make it what's in it for me. So, and I know um, all programs, you start with what's in it for me. So the way we influence that is a few things. I think you focus on what does the data actually say? Can you actually get some people across the line through data and evidence? And some people will come across, so that is a key, right? So for example, in the motorbikes, as we've rolled out more and more of the fleet, we've proved that we've had a 30 to 50% reduction in serious injuries by having a safer motor transport. So we can use data. I can use storytelling to get some people around about, you know, uh, so it's Anthony, it's not about you. It's about the road user that, you know, our recent postie who was killed is a four wheel drive driver who made an error. Nothing to do with you. You can be the world's best postie, best motorbike rider. There's no way you can stop a four wheel drive who you think is going to stop it as a giveaway sign and doesn't, right? So you just, so some, some people you get on that. Um, other 
And I think ultimately, and, and the union was key in this, is, is a lot of the data trying to get them across. And they've stopped arguing with us now about whether motorbikes are safer and they're more into, therefore, how do you make these golf carts better? Because our guys are telling us that, you know, this is an issue and that's an issue. So that's yep. at least a move in the right direction. And then the other thing is I just think just you've got to have commitment from the leadership to change, right? So with all this noise, that gets back to the leadership and you've got to be really clear that this is a, this is a, this is a goal. We're a long-term goal. Let's not wobble on this um, because if we start wobbling on based on feedback from people on a change, we will probably never get there. So you've got to have yep. clear. Um, and part of my role and others at senior roles is to try and keep influencing and supporting those changes. Mm. And then I think... Ultimately, some people just, you, you know, you won't get across the line. And then those people, you're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to vote with their feet, really. Like, do they want to be the future or do they want to be the past? And and that's a legitimate concern. Like, some people want to ride motorbikes. Go, go and ride an Uber, you know, be an Uber rider or a delivery if that's really what you want to do. But um, ultimately, we will get rid of motorbikes. And if that's your role for being here, then you might want to find somewhere else if you can't come across. So all of that's a legitimate strategy, I think. Yeah, right. And look, it's a really interesting one about not wobbling because, you know, when you're undergoing a transformational process and particularly cultural transformation process, it can feel so slow. It can feel, and sometimes it feels like you're not going anywhere and it can be really difficult to show, I guess, or, or understand what the tangible results look like. And Deidre, this is one I'm going to direct towards you because I think you might have some um, some fairly good perspectives in this space. You know, what should, what, how do you measure success? You know, how do you create the value proposition? What does good, how do we know we're actually progressing through a cultural transformation? How do we measure it? Because I, I know often we go to something like a TRIFA or, or something like that. Um, and obviously we, we know there's some challenges with, with metrics like that. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. So um, in my organisation, we um, haven't had a fatality for quite, a number of years here. So if I think about the burning platform that, and I don't like to necessarily use that because obviously we handle a lot of gas here, but if I think about what Rod's just talked about and what David's talked about, we don't have that, if you like, um, in terms of change motivator um, from a fatality point of view. So I think, um, you know, my challenge is slightly different because I know that we still need to change. Um, uh, because if we don't keep moving, the world's, it's getting more and more complex. So if you don't continue to move with the complexity that's around you, both from an external environment perspective, but also from an internal perspective, um, things will just get away from you pretty quickly. So I think if if I reflect on, um, you know, my history uh, um, as a professional, um, I've rolled out a lot of things. You know, we tend to like to roll things out. Um, whether that's in a safety space or in other spaces, we roll out a whole heap of stuff. Where, you know, it's programmatized everything, I think. So, so where I'm at now is actually not programmatizing um, the next piece of work. Um, and so that's actually been quite an interesting journey because people are looking for a product. It's like, well, I don't have a product um, and um, I haven't got some next shiny um, bauble for you and I don't have a silver bullet. So this is actually the change that we're now going to make. It's actually deep down in the organisation and it's not something that I'm going to be able to hand to you on a plate. So at the same time, that then comes the question will come as well, how do you measure something that you haven't programmatized? So it's like, well, how many people have you put through? Or what's your TRIFA rate, whatever. Um, and look, we're really at a point in, in my organization where um, we've hit an asymptote in terms of TRIFA. So we're right down the bottom at 2.6 or 2.8 from a TRIFA perspective. So it's actually meaningless to us now. Um, so, you know, I think what is really important for us is actually to be out there talking to our people and listening to what they're telling us. Are people say do they feel safe to speak up? Is there is there a um, a culture of responding to failure um, 
is a, a positive thing. It, do people see, you know, uh, stopping work as a good thing or as a or as a bad thing? How do we respond to, you know, traffic light reports? Are we looking at the green in terms of the oh gee that scares me a little bit, or are we looking at the red and saying oh well, that's really bad we need to make that green? So I think how we look at the data needs to evolve over time, um, and um, the metrics and how we measure things also needs to evolve over time. So I don't think there's a silver bullet to any of this. So I can't say to you measure this and then you'll know because I don't think it works like that. And that's kind of how we've probably tried to make it fit before. But I think where we're at as an organisation is quite different to that. So um, I'm trying to look at weak signals. So if I think about where our system is moving in and out of tolerance, if you like, so I know we've got critical controls in place. So where are we deviating from the critical controls in terms of the barriers we've got in place and being more control focused versus um, reactive or we're measuring an outcome because something went wrong, if you like. So if you're in that space, you're measuring the absence of safety rather than the presence of control. So that's really where I'm trying to shift culturally, um, which is quite a big shift in terms of both uh, where we've been as an organisation, but also culturally external. Um, so you're thinking about stakeholders, you're thinking about shareholders, you're thinking about um, other organisations. And, and I think um, it can be quite challenging. Um, but what I do know about it is that we're seeing our people people starting to believe that we're actually oh, I've lost you Deidre. So really uh, Anthony, to know I can just... when something is not quite the way it should be. So they're starting to tell us a huge shift. That's great Deidre. Um, so, yeah, so uh, what I'm hearing is moving beyond, I guess, programs or, or projects uh, and moving towards uh, well this is the way we do business kind of mindset and, and adjusting what success looks like against you know what it is is the key focus area or the critical risks at a particular point in time and I know risk you've got um, Rod you've got a, a pretty good focus on critical risk in the work that you do typically as well yeah and, and like Australia Post is a good example of trying to uh, this issue like every safety person in every company at some point gets measured against TRIFR or LTIFR, or whatever. We all hate it. We all go, it's such a blunt instrument, such a linear, um, unhelpful measure. Like it's useful in some ways, knowing what injury rates are, but it tells you nothing about forklift accidents. It tells you nothing about the amount of deaths that have happened in a, a fishing trawler, right? It will have no correlation to your TRIFR probably. So what, I think is like what I try and do is make sure we have a balanced approach. I don't think you can walk into a board or an organisation that's heavily focused down one way traditionally and suddenly change them overnight. You've got to slowly ease them over. One way of doing that with the critical risk focus is once you start understanding a critical risk and they typically are things that don't drive your injury rate, especially in a big company uh, like Australia Post, a lot of our 44% of our injuries are manual handling, 22% are, 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 are motorbike related. Um, and then there's slips and trips, all the normal stuff, right? So, but forklifts kill people. We haven't had a death in forklifts here, but we have a, like a thousand forklifts running around with pedestrians. So if we don't focus, on, if we just focus on injury rates, we'll never get to forklifts until someone dies, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's a good example. We're saying, okay, so what are the things that we can say? Let's get clarity. So we've now got real clarity on the 10 most common serious risks that we have in the business. We said, what are the key controls out of the thousands of things you do? And what are the um, behaviours associated with that? So, and then how do we get a laser-like focus on those? And that starts to shift the conversation from just injuries to injuries are part of the picture, but also exposures and you know, um, uh, and then once you start looking at exposures, I think that drives you to a different level of conversation. And it's just a journey. You won't do it overnight and it takes a bit of time. But once you start getting there, then people start worrying less about injuries, more about inputs that drive injuries and more about exposures that drive risk. Yeah. And that's look, really such, helpful. Oh, look, and it's such a big conversation right now because TRIFA is so ingrained in the reporting mechanisms of so many executive teams and so many 
boards, right? Like what's your TRIFA rate? How do we benchmark across industry? And we all know that's a fairly inexact kind of measure. And the risk, of course, attached to that you know, being a lag indicator, and we know all the other challenges is what I often will see within organizations is they'll run, Deidre, to your point, a campaign or a program or a project, uh, and they'll go really hard at something for you know, six months or 12 months or whatever it might be. And what happens is the TRIFA rate goes down for whatever reason, uh, whether it's good luck, good management, or you know, whatever the case may be, then all the wind goes out of the sails and then the attention of the executive moves on to, well, what's the next, what's the most important thing right now? And safety sort of is left to the side as, oh, well, it's kind of okay at, at the moment. How do you keep a sustained focus? I mean, David, you, uh, your business has been recognized for some amazing things and a, yeah, a really high risk, industry around safety. So you mentioned that fatality in 2013. How do you maintain the safety focus, even though your safety results might be improving, you know, even though you might be, you know, finding that you've got more engagement and more inputs, how do you keep bringing the executive team back to what is a really crucial thing, which, you know, if you take your eye off, the, like, it's, it's not something that you do safety and it's done. It's something that's a continual process that we need to work on. Yeah, I think there's a there's another distinction there for me, and um, I'm probably black for centres here, Anthony. But um, like post post the event, we did some work on um, just on teams, communications, leadership, um, uh, respect. You know, all that all that basic stuff. And um, we're coming from a long way back in agribusiness, and and I lump um, fishing as a sector with um, farming generally, but um, you know, as a sector, we're still uh, seriously underperforming uh, other parts of the economy in terms of safety performance. But um, it was really critical for me, and um, our, our guys aren't always uh, uh, particularly well educated. They come from mixed backgrounds. They, um, uh, but they, they, they love what they do there, right? And um, I think some of the some of the training that we provided through you guys was the first sort of training of any type that these guys had ever seen. So, you know, we sit here with our uh, our clean shirts and crisp collars in capital cities, and and you got access to all this stuff. But for these guys in the field, um, that was brand brand new, and there were some real aha moments. You know, the you know the, the gorilla walking through the the um, the, uh, the netball players and. Um, uh, and things got to thinking uh, thinking about that, but the um, the cherry really and uh, the distinction for me that drives all this um, is yes safety focus, but it brings a whole bunch of other um, co benefits. So we got say eleven prawn boats. They're all you know five, six, seven crew on board. Uh, as I said, they spend extended times together. But what we can see from boats that have you know. Um, Good leadership, whether whether the skipper's able to make it clear what he wants, he sets consistent and firm boundaries where where his team are um, psychologically safe and uh, are encouraged to speak their mind uh, with it, without fear or favour. Where they each look after each other, they're looking out for each other. Then um, a lot a lot of amazing things happen. They um, they catch more prawns. They're happy. They, um, the prawns they do catch, they, uh, they, they pack better and they're and better quality. They get more sleep, um, they, uh, they safe and um, they come home and they made more money. So what's not to love, Anthony? <laughs> so really interesting and yeah, that sort of feeds in, I think, to, to the next question to an extent. Yeah, we, we talk about safety often in isolation to the rest of the organisation, however, Safety needs to inform, from what I'm hearing, David, the organisational strategy. Um, you know, how does safety enable us to do better, go faster, get better results? But we also need to be thinking about, well, what's the what's the clear benefit that can be defined you know, to the workforce? And, and in that instance, it sounds like you know, uh, better sleep and more money sound like a couple of good benefits that I'd be pretty keen to to have a go at. You know, just and it's and it's underpinned with this with with this respect, looking after your mates. You know, we uh, together we're going to bring us all home, um, and they're just kind of they're just they're just impossible enduring human characteristics that um, can't help can't help but 
um, uh, I think be much more powerful than um, say filling in a form and doing a, an induction um, online induction piece or something. You know, they're um, and they're so much more compelling from a business point of view. And uh, in our chat, we uh, we talked about the impact of the business of um, of a death and what happens when um, you know you've got a, a young bloke pitches up to to come and join you at the start of the season. His, his mum does a Google search and she says, uh, <laughs> not a chance, mate. These guys, these guys kill blokes. So, um, um, you know, that's really, it's, uh, there's a lot of really good reasons for getting on uh, top of this. And then, and then there's providing them the team with the tools. So, and again, not all of our guys have had the tools um, to work systematically through safety management systems and to think about the different parts of the job that are dangerous and to talk, you know, sit down and have a talk about, well, you know, we've got to put the boards out, who's going to do what? Um, if we wear a vest, then this is the consequences. Um, so all of those things just improve that quality of the understanding um, in their practice. You're creating, um, you're creating more trust and better communication. And as a result, you've sort of you know, if you, 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 you've even respected the new pair of eyeballs that comes and says, "Well, what about that block in the rig?" You know, I haven't, I haven't seen that check for a while. It could be, um, could be a good thing to do. Um, so, um, I'm rambling a bit now, but I'm, I'm a big fan of that sort of behavioural work because um, I think it is easy for uh, workers in cer certain situations to feel it. Um, they have some, some um, cloak cloak of uh, protection around them because they've they've done the online course and they've um, and they've signed the form and she'll be sweet but and then and then just turn off to the um, the blind everyday serious risk uh, sources of risk in their um, in their daily job yeah and, and I'd imagine Deirdre uh, to, to carry this across to you in your industry and in your space there's probably so many uh, and with not having had a fatality in such a low recordable injury frequency rate and all those types of things, there could easily be a sense of um, security or, or 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 a sense of complacency that could could creep into an organisation that yeah you know, that has got things so uh, like so so seemingly managed. How do you continue to to drive safety culture change through the workforce? How do you keep people so? Yeah, David's got one set of, you know, every day is a little bit different, but for someone like you, Deirdre, where you're trying to keep people thinking about safety and keep it really front of mind, how do you drive that through the workforce daily? So I think it's a really interesting question. I think um, the workforce that we've got is, you know, we've got we've got people crawling through boilers, we've got people driving, you know, um, large, you know, 40 tonne tankers with LPG in it. We've got people on roofs all over the country. So I actually think that the people we've got doing the work are um, quite aware and conscious of the risks that, that they face every day. I think part of the challenge is that it's easy to go into automatic mode. Nobody goes to work thinking today's the day I'm going to fall off a roof or today's the day I'm going to get my arm chopped off, right? So, um, and I think part of the opportunity that we've got is to start to talk to our workforce around how we do some of these jobs really well all the time and what makes them successful work all the time. Why don't we kill? people because the risks are there. Our people are there every day doing really high risk activities, including our contractors. So we're starting to now have conversations around um, bringing people together and go, well, tell us why you're so successful. We want to really understand what makes your work easy, what makes it hard, and how, we, how can we improve um, so that um, you yeah, might be that you know, these things actually make my job really difficult and it could be that we've put in 25 forms when we need one um, and get them involved in and the solutions and um, owning those solutions and then really listening to a workforce when they tell us those things. So I think there's been um, uh, a, a bit of a, 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 the voice of the front line doesn't often get heard um, as well as it should up through organisations. So I think there's a really important um, 
piece for us there around how do we bring the people who are at the pointy end of the work together to get them to describe why things go well um, and ask us and then it, for what they need and then listen to them and then how do we then tell that story to our executives so that they've got a better understanding of some of the challenges that are faced right at the front line um, because if people understand, people, every, everyone's in it together, right? We're all, we've all got a job in an organization to make the organization successful um, and listening to people and um, actually actually really listening to them and not making biased judgments, um, I think is really important. So, it, it, you know, I don't, I think that, you know, assurance <coughs> activities are really important, but I also think this whole piece around, really listening to what people are doing and why they're doing it particular ways there's a richness in there um, um, around improvement because every single person i've met in this organization uh, wants to do a great job uh, wants to do a great job and make our organization successful um, and we put barriers in place all the time for that not to be where we're at so oh, yeah look it's so I, I think that's a really important point Deirdre because often um yeah safety is seen as just something we've got to get done or yeah it's a barrier uh, it's only something we focus on when something goes wrong but I guess what you're suggesting here is how do we learn from what goes right you know how do we actually take high performing parts of the business understand that work better and make it even better so I think that yeah learning from successes is a really important point um, that, that yeah, I took away from what you just said there. So how do we hunt the good stuff and, and really reinforce that? And it's really interesting because when we do that, people kind of look at us strangely and go, well, what do you want to know that? Like that's, you know, normally, normally, you, you know, we see, well, <laughs> we've been changing over time, but you know, the normal dialogue could be, well, normally we'll see you when something goes wrong or we see our manager when something goes wrong versus uh, people don't usually come out and talk to us about how and why something's going well. It's only when it doesn't go well that we see people come out and ask us what we need. Um, and I think that's a real cultural shift and it, it won't happen overnight, but um, if we can start having those conversations um, and then and then really listen to what our people are saying, I think is just a huge opportunity for us to move past compliance um, into a different place. It's really shifting the conversation to a more positive place around safety. You know, how is, how is safety enabler? How do we use safety? and leadership as a way of, of engaging people more effectively? How do we shift the perceptions of the workforce even within the leadership group from being an army of problems to an army of problem solvers? So um, yeah, again, it's a complete different flip on safety, isn't it? Where we're typically out there, you know, um, yeah, to, to David's point, we can't walk past the stuff that you know, is gonna put someone at, at harm, but how many things do we walk past every day which people are doing amazingly right, um, but you know, we don't say anything. Uh, and what impact does that have on people in the long term and their frames around safety? I think it comes to reward and punishment too. So we've had quite a lot of discussions around that and I can see Rod nodding his head. Um, and um, I, I think that, um, you know, we punish people um, in many, many ways um, for either speaking up or not speaking up or even following process, even if the process is, you know, we might reward people for getting the job done, even if it's done unsafely, because we don't know. Um, yep. And then as soon as it goes wrong, then we punish the person who did it exactly the same way yesterday, but didn't have a negative outcome. So I think there's so much in this richness around understanding the deviation from normal work. And then how do we think about that in a different way? Yep. My suspicion is we've got a bunch of listeners violently nodding along here, right, as I can see yourself and, and David doing. Just, just Rod. So let's imagine you're starting in a in a new organisation, or perhaps you're in, a, you, yeah, you've been in the organisation for a little while, and you're hearing these conversations, and you're going, right, you know, we've we've got to start talking about this stuff. What we're doing is just, it's in the past. You know, we need to move into, you know, putting a more proactive, positive lens around around safety. How do you how do you tackle that? Like. Um, what do you need to do personally to prepare yourself for that 
for that journey. But then also, uh, and I'll open this up to the broader group. Yeah, what what are the ways that you start threading some of this information? Because I'd imagine some of the, some of the things you mentioned, Deirdre, when you mentioned those to to some people within the organisation, they're like, oh, yeah. What do you mean we can't focus? Like Triffer isn't the best thing to focus on. What do you mean we need to hunt the good stuff when it comes to safety? So where do you, where, what do you think, Rod? Where do you start? Put you on the spot. I oh, look. There's a couple. <laughs> yeah, couple things, um, Anthony. I think you need you need to educate yourself a bit. So resources like the stuff you've got um, on the centre's website, the OHS body of knowledge chapter on culture change, um, going to some seminars, and there's a lot of free or very cheap um, discussion panels around the place. I think that is a really key start in networking for them. So I always say to the safety people, if you don't know other people in other organisations and you're not out there learning from them and thinking what you can bring back, I think that's an opportunity missed because Boards and senior managers and people, they love looking across the ditch going, oh, what are they doing over there? I think we should do more of that. Um, so I think that's one thing you can do. The second thing is um, look at uh, how you partner up either internally or externally or both with people who will help you deliver change. So the bit that David talked about, about productivity measures. So we, we've done some um, great work. Whenever I do work in any organisation and I can find someone in operations and prove that good operational productivity is, is linked to safety improvements and vice versa, you get significant kudos because suddenly they go, oh, right, okay, so we can be safe and productive. And, um, and that, so finding those people and those programs or those uh, initiatives that will help drive that and then that builds a lot of momentum because it's you know pays for itself and then sometimes you need to go external and get some external help so I come into companies you know I've been in quite a few companies and, and they hire you because you're this you know you you must know because he's been over there and he's all look look you know he's got his great CV whatever and then you come into the company and now you're part of the like you very quickly become not the expert, you're the internal person. Well, you would say that, right? You're the safety person, you would say that. Yeah. But sometimes bringing external people in who can relate, be they a census or, um, you know, I've, I've used in um, my current organisation, we, we did the strategy when I first arrived and then we've had four key elements and we've had four external groups come and vet different parts of that strategy and talk to the board and say, well, you know, the strategy is pretty sound, I'd tailor it a bit here. And suddenly because they're external, or the the right age group or whatever the board goes oh it must be true this other person said it right so sometimes that's yeah. a good thing like using consultants or external people to help validate what you already know can help influence because you know people do see internal people sometimes as vested interests you would say that because you're the safety person and you know and you know having an external voice can actually help be a change um, element so I'd look at that and you know if you can afford it that's great some some you just got to find somewhere that's um, able to help you um, deliver that change message. So, um, it's sort of Anthony, Anthony, can I break the rules and ask a question of my other panelists? Of course, please do. Um, for you highly trained health uh, um, health and safety professionals, um, when you come to select health and safety officers, there's two there's two types, right? Um, there's the compliance type that might have come from um, police training. And uh, there's the other type, which is um, I'm from safety. I'm here to help. Um, talk, talk me through the two choices. Uh, I never picked the compliance police. So in fact, if I was just talking to Anthony yesterday about some, we've been hiring some people and the pe person who stood out the most in this senior role was people who talk about partnerships, people who talk about the non-technical skills, because the technical skills are a given, right? I expect a safety person to have a certain level of technical skill. That's the easy stuff. It's about how do you influence change and, and become a partner in change. And if you are all about compliance and I set up a process and then I check the process works and I, I tell people about the process or they start quoting the legislation to me, I just turn off, I go, right, if that's your change, that will get you nowhere, right? That is, or it gets you somewhere, but it doesn't get you where you need to be. Um, so it's definitely got to be a partner, David. So I look at those soft skills and I knock back a lot of people who don't have them. And I, I'll rather have a vacancy than hire someone who's a, who's, who's a police person because they need to show they can coach and adapt and influence. Um, and they, of course they need to know what they're talking about. And that's the technical side. 
yeah. and the safety person that thinks they're um, the line manager. Where um, so that, that's another challenging one. Well, I think yes. there's two, two, there's two times, right? So I think we we swing between um, I'm the safety manager, so it's my problem to manage, and and some of the safety people believe that as well, right? This is my job to manage, and <laughs> it's not your job. Line managers manage. Yeah. But also, you can't be, well, I'm like the consultant, I'll just swing in and tell you, especially on the internal, I'll just swing in and tell you the problem, and then I'll run away, and you best, it's up to you to do it. You go, no, 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 it doesn't work that way either. You've got skin in the game, so you've got to find a happy medium between being a partner for change, accountable for the change, but not the only person accountable for the change. The line manager is ultimately accountable, but you can't just be a consultant who rocks in and says, oh, here's your problem, you better fix it. I'll come back in a year's time and see how it's going. You know, that, that you will get no credibility if you do that. So. So Deirdre, those think, soft skills are really important. Yeah, they are. I think I, I, I'm with Rod. I, I, I don't hire. I don't hire the police type safety person, and sometimes I don't even hire a safety person because I think some of those skills can be taught. Right. So, well, a lot of those those technical skills can be taught. I think um, I'd rather hire somebody who had. I, I mean, I hate the term soft skills because I think they're the hardest skills to um, learn. Um, so um, people who, um, like Rod was talking about, who've got those interpersonal skills, I think are really, really important. Um, but also I think there's a piece around um, understanding business context. So often I think part of the missing piece is that safety people um, either get told or want to swim in their own lane. And I think, um, and this isn't to say that we should be managing operations because that is for the manager to do that. But I think it's super important for um, safety professionals um, to really understand the business drivers. So if you haven't got a commercial lens on why business is doing something or why a change is happening from a business perspective, you can't actually then service the business as a partner in the way that it needs to be serviced. And often safety people don't have commercial acumen or business acumen. And I think that's a skill that is invaluable when you're trying to partner with an organization. So that's, yeah, I look for that um, when I'm hiring. Right. Oh, look, uh, so what I'm hearing is the role of a safety leader in an organisation, there's, there's a strong reliance on good interpersonal skills and developing great interpersonal skills, you know, understanding and, and getting business acumen. Um, there's real strategy involved you know thinking about well what are we trying to achieve what's the business trying to achieve how, how are all the different parts of the puzzle into play and and i guess feeding into that um strategy and interpersonal skills like you mentioned rod well what levers do i have to actually help me get a result you know is there a connection with someone from another organization is there a consultant is there you know an sme that i can bring in that can can elevate my my pitch so uh, it really is a, a, a space that's transforming uh, at a rate of knots. And, and I know that's a, a challenge a number of organisations are grappling with is uh, yeah, perhaps having safety cops, for lack of a better term, and, and looking at moving into that coaching, transitioning into that coaching space and partnering space. So really, really useful insights. Um, just to throw it out there, any closing thoughts? So let's imagine you've, we've got, uh, 100 odd listeners sitting on the line, nodding along, going, right, um, you know, I've got some of those skills, uh, you know, I need to develop some others. Um, but they want to further their career and they want to further their ability to create positive change. Um, so you, you spoke about being a continuous learner, right? Yeah, there, there are any resources or tips that, that the people, uh, that, that the three of you can guide people towards to, to continue that journey for themselves? So to, to me, um, I came into safety from a business background. So I was one of those people that had none of the safety skills when I started, but I went and self-educated on the safety stuff to get, because I looked around, I said, look, at our level, at Deidre's at my level, the majority of people um, have fairly senior um, postgraduate or above qualifications in safety. So you go, well, that sort of makes sense because how are you gonna interpret stuff if you don't know what they're talking about? But you might be a GM because you got moved across because you're awesome people skills. But if you were hiring externally, you look for that plus technical, right? So 
I would say you've got to do that. Um, for me, the other thing is I think just think listening back is for those people who are sitting online who go, well, I don't work in an Aussie post or somewhere where I can afford consultants or um, you start with, you can start with inviting people that you know through networks to come and talk to your team for free. So there are people that you will meet who will gladly come and talk to your leadership group for a, an hour or half an hour and just say, this is like David Carter, if you know, you know him or someone knows someone in his organisation, I'll invite him along and he'll come and talk to your leadership team. So you can get free sort of initiatives where people will talk and they'll have some credibility and don't always have to pay for it to start with. Um, it might be just through networks and contacts that starts the ball rolling and gets some um, change happening. Excellent. Thanks, Rod. Good tips. How about yourself, Dave? David, um, where do you where do you go to look for for some of this stuff? Um, my safety guys. Um, the um, uh, yeah, so that 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 whole space. Um, I think in our small business, and we're we're just not a patch on um, with uh, Telstra or Origin are at. So uh, brother, um, Australia Post or Origin are at. Um, but we have our own unique challenges. Um, for me, I think the great challenge with safety is, is um, finding fresh ways to say the same old stuff to some extent. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting space. It's a, bit, it's a bit like the HR role, only with technical skills that are able to come to the fore with um, uh, uh, helping, helping the guys get better at their own craft. Uh, we've spent quite a bit of time uh, developing some of the electronic tools because we're away uh, away from port, and it's just it's not easy just to walk down walk down to the shop and have a look at how the um, the three uh, the the three wheel bikes are going, uh, or chat to the guys. We get we get to see them once or twice a year, frankly, and that that's really really tough. So we've got some um, uh, some online learning modules that we've made available both internally and now in externally to the broader industry in a way that you know, lifts safety performance uh, across the whole uh, sector. Uh, we've also made reporting easier. So one of the cultural challenges for us has been um, just near misreporting hasn't been um, embraced or under, uh, fully understood. So uh, we just, just keep having to reinforce this uh, this notion that near miss reports are a gift. Um, they're uh, circulated to others and, and in doing that they become reminders of those things that you need to check. Um, and so I think you know the, the, the safety practitioner in a business like ours um, has, has to be you know that that helpful technician. We have we have tried the police approach and I agree with it wasn't very successful. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's uh, it's supporting the line managers. It's finding fresh and novel ways to uh, keep safety at the at the front of mind. And I, I just come back to there is a much bigger case um, for uh, good safety as it's as manifests through just building effective, loving, nurturing, respectful, good community, highly performing teams. Um, and if we can do that and like safety is almost just a dividend, like everything else just falls into place. So, you know, for a CEO, um, yeah, the, the things I worry about is where the business is going to be in five and 10 years time and how's the culture. And that's the culture of, you know, all those things we're talking about. It's just, um, uh, is everybody getting along? Are they happy? Are they feeling yeah, psychologically safe? Blah, blah, blah. It's great, David. And Deidre, I'll throw back to you in just a moment, just before I do so, we, we, Rod, you mentioned networking. Um, so what we want to be able to create is a, a follow-up conversation for people. So I'll ask uh, Christy to, to pop up a poll on, on the screen just now. Um, and in this poll, it's just an opportunity for anyone that's interested in, in, in increasing their network and, and hearing other people's perspective, learning from their experiences to participate in a 90-minute interactive discussion. So you can see that uh, up on the screen just there. Um, so there's small group discussions, really great for networking. We're going to be discussing the topic of elevating sa the safety culture case to the board. So if that is an area of interest to you, click yes and one of our team will get in contact with you and 
and arrange arrange that conversation so you can get on board and, and have a chat. So Deirdre, just before we close out, um, I know you're a real learner in the safety space and you've been involved in some, some podcasts and things. Where would you guide people's attention to if they want to further their their knowledge in this space? Yeah, so I I think there's um, a huge amount like like Rod spoke about um, opportunity in the network. So build your network and reach out if you don't have one or you need some help in building your networks. Um, we've got them; they're out there, and um, people are so generous with their time. It's my experience, and even people who um, you know overseas, there's people everywhere that are willing to help. So I think that's super important. If you don't have one, build one. And then I think educate yourself. So part of what um, I've certainly learned over the last few years is that things are moving so quickly and there's so much information out there. Um, if you're a reader, read. I'd point you to things like uh, Paper Save, um, Whole Nagel, Lloyd, um, Conklin, Decker, the whole lot. There's a whole, there's so many resources out there in terms of um, that sort of thing. Podcasts are a great way to learn if you're not a reader um, and educate yourself. And then I think too, like for me, I kind of got there earlier, like a while ago. So I was, sort of, I've always been a learner, but my team probably hadn't been as much as me. So I think find ways to educate your team as well and build capability because the safety professional um, we were looking at five years ago is very different to the safety professional we're looking at now, which will be very different to the safety professional we'll be looking at in five years time. So that continuous learning is super important both for us um, as well as the teams that we're supporting is what I would say. That's great Deirdre and look some some really good resources there and I must admit not a big reader but I love a podcast and I, and I love an audio book. So um, lots of different vehicles these days. Uh, we're on the hour. Thank you so much, David, Rod and Deirdre for your contributions. You know, we've got lifelong learners obviously listening in. I'm sure they'll have taken heaps of valuable tools and resources and ideas along, along again. Thank you also for your time and helping contribute to the safety community as a whole and getting more people home safe to the things and people that matter most to them. So again, uh, hopefully we can all catch up again soon. But in the meantime, thank you and thank you to everyone online.